The Night Lords were sticklers for justice, but not in a good way. I'd say they were more slightly obsessed with the punishment side rather than the crime side. They would hand out disproportionately cruel sentences for even the most trivial of crimes. But to be fair to them, it usually worked. And let's face it, if the punishment for staying out too late was having all your skin cut off and then your limbs removed, you would probably get indoors by 8 o'clock. These guys are characterized by their blue armor with cool lightning bolt patterns. And it's those lightning bolts which made me want to paint these models because I wanted to learn how to do them and it's surprisingly easy and I'm going to show you how to do it in this video. I also decided to make this quite a gory model because they're night lords, they've got a reputation for being sadists and war criminals and all this kind of stuff. So I've got bought a box of skulls and a new bottle of blood for the blood god paint and hopefully it's going to look pretty good. I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you at the end. The inspiration for this model came when I was going through my bit box and I found a few bits of an unfinished Dragon Prince box that I had knocking around. And the wings on the head seemed perfect for Night Lords and I was never going to finish these models so I thought I'm just going to chop it up. And I happened to have a spare Havoc body and some Chaos weapons knocking around that I'd bought off eBay a while ago. And that's a really good resource. Between eBay and Facebook Marketplace you can find pretty much any bit that you're looking for. You just need to ask the right people, search the right things, you'll probably find something similar or exactly what you want. That was a pretty delicate operation getting these wings off and I cut myself more times than I'm willing to admit. But just be very careful when you're doing things like this with a sharp knife. The original idea was to use this on the headpiece, but I decided it looked a little bit too big. So I scrapped that plan and I went for putting him on the shoulder pads instead. And to make him look a bit more seamless, I just bought up some green stuff and just moving it around so it looks like it's sort of fused to the armor with a bit of gore and viscera and etc. Very fitting of Night Lords. Now I'm still a bit of a rookie when it comes to using green stuff, but I found if you use a little bit of olive oil or vegetable oil, it'll keep it nice and wet for you and lubricated so you can make things smooth if you want and also shape it a bit easier. What I'm basically trying to do is just kind of drag it into little veiny type shapes. And this will just sort of hide the join where it attaches onto the shoulder pad. I also came across this piece, which is from a vampire count model. Um, it was a shame it was just a little bit too small for the body. So instead of this head, I opted for a reaver head with the skull face, which I think works very well. And of course, we're going to go with double melee weapons because it's a murderous maniac. And for the base, I'm going to use just some trusty cork board and some super glue. Uh, with this cork board, I buy it, it's usually pretty thin. So what I'll do initially is stick two sheets together so you've got a nice thick piece to work with. And then you can just rip chunks out so they look a bit more organic and rocky. And with a few dabs of your favorite super glue, you can just stick them together nice and quickly. You can use PVA for this, but I just wanted to get this stuck together nice and quickly so I could start priming, so I opted for super glue. I ended up buying this uh, skulls box from Citadel. I think it's about 35 Australian dollars and you get about 340 skulls in the box, which is pretty good. I'm sure there's other places you can buy skulls in bulk from, but yeah, this is actually a really fun box to have, especially if you have any chaos related conversions you want to do. And I just want to create like a, a pile of trophy skulls at the bottom of the base. So I'm just using a pair of tweezers and some super glue. And yeah, I'm just going to build them up until I'm happy with how it looks. And as you'll see later in the video, I actually added a lot more skulls to this. But for now, I think that looks pretty cool. To pin your models ready for airbrushing, I find the easiest way is to use a small drill bit and an unfolded paper clip cut to size. And I use a little dab of super glue just to keep the paper clip in place. And you can always snap this off pretty easily afterwards, so don't worry too much about it getting stuck. And I'm going to use the airbrush to prime and base coat this model. And for the primer, I use the Vallejo Black Primer, which is the uh, polyurethane primer. And I only really get the airbrush out on special occasions like this, or if I've got a big bulk army to do. Most of the time I'll use a Rust-Oleum spray can, which I think is probably the most cost effective primer on the market at the moment. You can get that from Bunnings or any hardware store in your country. I'm pretty sure Rust-Oleum is an international company, so I'm pretty sure you can get it in the UK and definitely in the US. I actually forgot to record this part, but a magic step with airbrushing is just to take a pure white 
and hit it from the very top of the model, just a few squirts, and that'll give you some nice natural highlights. And because the paint is actually translucent, you will sort of get the impression of these highlights through your next few coats of paint. And for this base coat, I'm going to use Cantor Blue, but I feel like it's n not quite dark enough, so I'm going to add a touch of black to it inside the airbrush. Uh, these Citadel paints aren't <laughs> ideal for airbrushing, but if you use a bit of thinner, probably about 50-50, get the consistency of milk inside your paint pot, and you should be fine. Once your first coat of blue is down, I'm just going to add a little touch of Calgar blue to the colour uh, just to line it up a bit and use the same technique as we did with the white. As you can see, I'm doing it from the very top angle of the model. This just yeah picks up all the edges and gives you a nice little highlight. This is called zenithal highlighting if you wanted to look up any other tutorials regarding this technique. And to me, this technique is oh, it's the best. I love the way it looks and it's so easy as well. Now the base coat's done, I'm going to do a recess wash with Drukey Violet. Uh, I chose purple rather than blue just because it's going to come out a little bit darker. I thought this blue was a little bit lighter than I'd wanted, so I'm just going to try this purple on here to try and darken it down a bit. You could use Nolan Oil or any other black wash if you like, but um, I'm sort of sick of using that because I use it on almost every model I've ever painted. And I'm pretty sure I'm going to use it when I do the metal parts on this too. So it's Drukey Violet and get that into all the little nooks and crannies, especially on this power fist. It's got a lot of little opportunities to increase the definition of the model. And now I'm going to move on to the metallics. Uh, for this first one, I'm going to use Balthasar Gold. It's a bit of a antique -y kind of looking gold, which I think sort of suits the theme of this model. And considering this Space Marine's probably around 10,000 years old, it's pretty fitting to use an old looking gold rather than a nice shiny bright one. And it's good to do your metallics in a block together because you'll want to wash your, your paintbrush water straight after this because you'll start getting bits of glitter in there and that's not good. Uh, this is a pretty time consuming part of this model since it's got a lot of decorative parts on the armor that you want to try and do. Uh, just take your time with it. Every little step gets you closer to a finished product so just keep that in mind even if it starts getting a bit tedious. I lose my focus quite a lot sometimes, so I'll just go away for 10 minutes and then come back and just keep chipping away at it. You can also make life easy for yourself if you hold your model on an angle and try and use the flat edge of the brush for sort of raised parts like this, because the brush is just automatically going to catch the highest area. Yeah, it's little tips and tricks like that that can sort of take away the the hard parts of painting minis. I mean, it always looks really difficult when someone's doing that looks half decent, but there's usually an easy way to do it. And for all the steel parts on the model, I'm gonna use my trusty Vallejo Gunmetal Gray. And I'm gonna pick out all of the bits of chain on the front of this model. And on the back, there's all the little joints between the armors. And then there's a few pipes on the front of his chest that I'm gonna to do too. Uh, I do bang on about this paint quite a lot, but it really is one of the best metallics that I've ever used. Just for the pure ease of use, one coat, super thin, oh, it's, it's awesome. And if Filejo are listening, I'll have some free pots, please. Uh, for the skulls, I'm going to start with Rakarth Flesh. And these guys have a bit of a skull fetish, so there are quite a few on their armour. And don't forget the faceplate of the helmet as well. Now, I like to use this Rakarth Flesh because it's a little bit lighter and I like to use the wash to try and bring out the tone that I want. This is by no means the right way to do it. There's lots of ways to paint skulls, but this is the one that sort of works for me. This face paint can be a bit tricky, but just take your time around all the little fiddly bits. And you can fill in the eyes while you're here as well because we're going to make them glow with a wash. Now I'm going to start painting the wings on the shoulder pads and I'm going to start with corn red. Now I like the darkness of this paint and it's usually my jumping off point when I do anything red. Either this or brown, depends how much time I want to spend on it. If you're going to do something really fancy, I would start with a brown and work your way up to a red. That just gives you nice deep shadows. Whilst that red's drying, I'm going to start washing all the armor with Agrax Earthshade. 
and this is a darker brown wash so it's going to make the armor look a little bit more antique and old and dirty where the brass parts meet the blue of the armor i just run a little bead down the edge just so it makes like a little outline or barrier between the two colors and for all the silvery metal parts the ever famous known oil don't leave home without it I'm usually pretty heavy with this stuff, but I think it's pretty forgiving if you put it in the right spots. Like I'm gonna pull it pretty heavy in this little centerpiece here, but it's gonna give it a nice little border. And because it's in a deep crevice, you won't really see the mess that it makes on a flat surface. And don't forget about the weapons too, get them nice and oily, because we're gonna come back and highlight them later. Now I'm gonna wash the red with this paint that I've never used before. It's Army Paint of Red Tone. And I'm just gonna kind of slop it on here just so it sort of fills in the crevices and gives it a bit of depth. I actually like the color in this wash. It's a lot more red than the Caribou Crimson from Citadel, which I find is a little bit more purpley than red. Now I'm gonna start giving the gold a bit of a highlight with Gehenna's gold. And rather than an all out edge highlight, I'm just gonna pick out little bits like the sharp edges of the corners and any points on the little triangly bits on the brass bits of the armor. Now we're going to highlight all the silver with Vallejo Dura Aluminium. Dura Aluminium? Dura Aluminium. And I'm just going to pick out like the edges of all the chains and the little vents in the middle. And with the chainmail in the middle, all I'm going to do is just drag the brush downwards over the chainmail and that should just pick up the links and leave the little holes black. And with the weapons, I'm just going to catch the edges of the blades like on this power claw and the same on the chainsaw and the little extra knife on the end of the chainsaw. And it's always good to change your water after you've finished with all your metallic paint so you don't get any of that sparkly pigment in your other paints. Now I'm going to highlight all the bones and skulls with Screaming Skull. And the main thing to look for here is around the eye sockets, um, the teeth, around the nose hole, and then just a general little highlight around the forehead. And it's the same principle on the face mask as well. Just um, I'm running it around the outside of the eye socket and just over that little nose hump and I'm going to pick out the teeth individually. Just take your time with this, take a few nice deep breaths and relax your jaw and then you'll be able to concentrate a lot better. And to highlight the red parts I'm going to use Mephiston Red. And again I'm going to concentrate on the edges and the higher parts of this. And I'm going to pick out a few of the tenderly parts that attach the wing to the shoulder blade just to make it look a little bit more organic and gory. And I want to try and keep the recesses on these wings quite dark so I'm going to leave them alone. And just another step up with the red, I'm going to use Evil Sun Scarlet which is a slightly brighter red while it's got a little bit more orange in it. And it's just general practice when you're doing uh, highlights with multiple colors, just as the color gets brighter, you just get more and more selective with where you put the paint. And I'm gonna knock it up another notch with a quick blast of Wild Rider Red, this time being even more selective just on the little points. And I repeated that whole process of the red on the little jewel in the middle of the armor. I probably should have mentioned this earlier, but I actually forgot about it. It's the exact same colors, you just work in circles and you make them smaller as you go. Now for the eyes, I'm just gonna do a little dab of pure white and just put this right in the center of the eye socket if you can. It's a little bit fiddly. I mean, I hate doing eyes, but I've never regretted putting the time in. Now this is the fun part. We're gonna do the lining bolts. And basically we're gonna start with a really faint watery line of Calgar blue, which is like a baby blue. And this will be the base for our lining bolt. And you don't have to be too careful with this first layer because this is going to be the base and we want this to be relatively thick, probably about one to two mil. And we're going to get brighter and brighter as we go until we get to pure white and each time getting a little bit thinner every time we do it. And just remember, sometimes less is more when you're doing little details like this. So don't go too overboard with the amount of lightning bolts that you do. Now I've done a couple of layers of bolts. I'm gonna go in with pure white and just do the thinnest lines I can possibly do. And you'll notice it sort of naturally gathers in certain little corners of the lightning bolts, but that's a good thing because that gives it a bit of depth and variety. It makes them a little bit more realistic. 
And for something that looks so cool, it's surprisingly easy to do. And you can use this method on your power weapons as well, like power swords or power axes, things like that, or anything that has lightning bolts on it. You could even try a green version of this for some warp stone if you're painting some Skaven models, for example. Now to finish off the eyes, it's super simple. All we're going to do is add a little dab of Blood Angels Red contrast paint. Or you can use any sort of red wash, just anything that's quite transparent. And that little white dot in the middle is going to make it look sort of 3D and look like lights reflecting through it. And for a little bit more schnaz, thin it down and run it around the edge of the eye socket will give it a slight glowing effect. And now we're going to work on the base. So if you grab your scoopy spready thing and your pot of texture paint, we can get started on this. And I'm just sort of using this to add a little bit more texture, obviously, as a texture paint. But I'm going to also use it to fill in any gaps that don't look right or cover any plain bits of base that are showing. And in a later video, I'll show you how to make your own texture paint so you don't have to buy these little pots of it. Once all that texture paint's dry, I'm going to give it a big wash with Black Templar. And you can use Nuln Oil if you want, but I just find this stuff's a little bit stronger. And this Skeleton Horde contrast paint is going to start toning the skulls. Uh, I don't think this is going to be strong enough to sort of add any pigment to the darker parts, but I'm going to worry about that later with a bit of dry brushing. And hopefully we can contrast it to make it so we don't have to do any fine details on these skulls. Now that actually turned out a bit better than I expected, so now I'm going to hit it with a dry brush of Rakoth Flesh. And I'm going to be pretty selective with this and being really careful not to get any on the black parts of the model. And just hitting sort of the tops of the skulls just to give it a little bit of contrast. Now I'm going to do the same again with Screaming Skull, which is a slightly lighter colour. 3 generally seems to be the magic number when it comes to highlighting models. You can go further, obviously the more you go the better it's probably going to look, but 3 is a good medium for having a, a nice looking model but without having to spend hours and hours and hours on it. Still with the dry brush, I'm going with the Celestra Grey which is a, a medium grey and I'm just going to hit this over all the black parts just to start bringing it up a little bit. I've tidied up the rim a little bit with some black and now we're going to use Blood for the Blood God which is a, a glossy blood paint. Now, there are a few manufacturers that make these blood paints but this is the one that I favour. But we all know corn favours blood from any source, so go nuts. But please don't use any organic blood. It'll dry brown anyway. And once your bloodlust has been sated, now we can move on to doing the weapons and parts of the model that you want to have blood on. It's the same dry brush and I'm just going to drag it over the edges of the sharp parts of the weapons. And just letting a little bit spill over onto the blue just to make it look like it's been used in action. And I could hear the voice of corn baying for more, so I opened up the pot again and started slapping some more blood onto the base. Now that looks plenty gory, I think we're about done with this and we're ready to assemble. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe, but push the button gently. Don't smash it. That's a bit too aggressive. And check back here every fortnight for new videos, and I hope to see you here again soon. Thank you, and goodbye.